The Hour of the Dragon by Robert E. Howard, Part 4, Chapter 15, The Return of the Corsair. Conan's first sensation of returning consciousness was that of motion. Under him was no solidity, but a ceaseless heaving and plunging. Then he heard wind humming through cords and spars and knew he was aboard a ship even before his blurred sight cleared. He heard a mutter of voices and then a dash of water deluged him, jerking him sharply into full animation. He heaved up with a sulfurous curse, braced his legs and glared about him with a burst of coarse guffaws in his ears and a reek of unwashed bodies in his nostrils. He was standing on the poop deck of a long galley which was running before the wind that whipped down from the north, her striped sail belling against the towed sheets. The sun was just rising in a dazzling blaze of gold and blue and green. To the left of the shoreline was a dim purple shadow. To the right stretched the open ocean. This much Conan saw at a glance that likewise included the ship itself. It was long and narrow, a typical trading ship of the southern coasts, high of poop and stern, with cabins at either extremity. Conan looked down into the open waste whence wafted that sickening abominable odor. He knew it of old. It was the body scent of the oarsmen chained to their benches. They were all negroes, forty men to each side, each confined by a chain locked about his waist with the other end welded to the heavy ring set deep in the solid runway beam that ran between the benches from stem to stern. The life of a slave aboard an Argosian galley was a hell unfathomable. Most of these were Cushits, but some thirty of the blacks who now rested on their idle oars and stared up at the stranger with dull curiosity were from the far southern isles, the homelands of the Corsairs. Conan recognized them by their straighter features and by their rangier, cleaner limbed build, and he saw among them men who had followed him of old. But all this he saw and recognized in one swift, all-embracing glance as he rose before he turned his attention to the figures about him. Reeling momentarily on braced legs, his fist clenched wrathfully. He glared at the figures clustered about him. The sailor who had drenched him stood grinning, the empty bucket still poised in his hand, and Conan cursed him with venom, instinctively reaching for his hilt. Then he discovered that he was weaponless and naked except for his short leather breeks. What lousy tub is this? he roared. How did I come aboard here? The sailors laughed jeeringly, stocky bearded Argosians to a man and one whose richer dress and air of command proclaimed him captain, folded his arms and said domineeringly, We found you lying on the sands. Somebody had wrapped you on the pate and taken your clothes. Needing an extra man, we brought you aboard. What ship is this? Conan demanded. The Venturer out of Messantia with a cargo of mirrors, scarlet silk cloaks, shields, gilded helmets and swords to trade to the Shemites for copper and gold ore. I am Demetrio, captain of this vessel and your master henceforward. Then I am headed in the direction I wanted to go after all, muttered Conan heedless of that last remark. They were racing southeastward, following the long curve of the Argosian coast. These trading ships never ventured far from the shoreline. Somewhere ahead of him, he knew that low, dark Stygian galley was speeding southward. 
Have you sighted a Stygian gully? Began Conan, but the beard of the burly, brutal face captain bristled. He was not in the least interested in any question his prisoner might wish to ask, and felt it high time he reduced this independent wastrel to his proper place. Get forward, he roared. I wasted time enough with you. I've done you the honor of having you brought to the poop to be revived and answered enough of your infernal questions. Get off this poop, you'll work your way aboard this galley. I'll buy your ship, began Conan before he remembered that he was a penniless wanderer. A roar of rough mirth greeted these words and the captain turned purple, thinking he sensed ridicule. You mutinous swine, he bellowed, taking a threatening step forward, while his hand closed on the knife at his belt. Get forward before I have you flogged. You'll keep a civil tongue in your jaws, or by Mitra I'll have you chained among the blacks to tug an oar. Conance's volcanic temper, never long at best, burst into explosion. Not in years, even before he was king, had a man spoken to him thus and lived. Don't lift your voice to me, you tar-breached dog! He roared in a voice as gusty as the sea wind, while the sailors gaped dumbfounded. Draw that toy and I'll feed you to the fishes! Who do you think you are? gasped the captain. I'll show you! roared the maddened Cimmerian, and he wheeled and bounded toward the rail where weapons hung in their brackets. The captain drew his knife and ran at him bellowing, but before he could strike, Conan gripped his wrist with a wrench that tore the arm clean out of the socket. The captain bellowed like an ox in agony, and then rolled clear across the deck as he was hurled contemptuously from his attacker. Conan ripped a heavy axe from the rail and wheeled cat-like to meet the rush of the sailors. They ran in, giving tongue like hounds, clumsy-footed and awkward in comparison to the pantherish Cimmerian. Before they could reach him with their knives, he sprang among them, striking right and left too quickly for the eye to follow and blood and brains spattered as two corpses struck the deck. Knives flailed the air wildly as Conan broke through the stumbling, gasping mob and bounded to the narrow bridge that spanned the waste from poop to forecastle, just out of reach of the slaves below. Behind him, the handful of sailors on the poop were floundering after him, daunted by the destruction of their fellows, and the rest of the crew, some thirty in all, came running across the bridge toward him with weapons in their hands. Conan bounded out on the bridge and stood poised above the upturned black faces, axe lifted, black mane blown in the wind. Who am I? he yelled. Look, you dogs! Look, Ajonga, Yasunga, Laranga! Who am I? And from the waist rose a shout that swelled to a mighty roar. Amra! It is Amra! The lion has returned! The sailors who caught and understood the burden of that awesome shout paled and shrunk back staring in sudden fear at the wild figure on the bridge. Was this in truth that the bloodthirsty ogre of the southern seas who had so mysteriously vanished years ago, but who still lived in gory legends? The blacks were frothing crazy now, shaking and tearing at their chains and shrieking the name of Amra like an invocation. Kushites, who had never seen Conan before, took up the yell. The slaves in the pen under the after cabin began to batter at the walls, shrieking like the damned. 
Demetrio hitching himself along the deck on one hand and his knees livid with the agony of his dislocated arm screamed in and kill him dogs before the slaves break loose fired to desperation by that word the most dread to all galley men the sailors charge onto the bridge from both ends but with a lion-like bound Conan left the bridge and hit like a cat on his feet on the runway between the benches. Death to the masters! He thundered and his axe rose and fell crashingly full on a shackle chain, severing it like matchwood. In an instant a shrieking slave was free, splintering his oar for a bludgeon. Men were racing frantically along the bridge above, and all hell and bedlam broke loose on the venturer. Conance's axe rose and fell without pause, and with every stroke a frothing, screaming black giant broke free, mad with hate and the fury of freedom and vengeance. Sailors leaping down into the waist to grapple or smite at a naked white giant hewing like one possessed at the shackles, found themselves dragged down by hands of slaves yet unfreed, while others, their broken chains whipping and snapping about their limbs, came up out of the waist like a blind black torrent, screaming like fiends, smiting with broken oars and pieces of iron, tearing and rending with talons and teeth. In the midst of the melee, the slaves in the pen broke down the walls and came surging up on the decks, and with fifty blacks freed on their benches, Conan abandoned his iron hewing and bound it up on the bridge to add his notched axe to the bludgeons of his partisans. Then it was massacre. The Argosians were strong, sturdy, fearless like all their race, trained in the brutal school of the sea. But they could not stand against these maddened giants led by the tigerish barbarian. Blows and abuse and hellish suffering were avenged in one red gust of fury that raged like a typhoon from one end of the ship to the other, and when it had blown itself out, but the one white man lived aboard the venturer, and that was the blood-stained giant about whom the chanting blacks thronged to cast themselves prostrate on the bloody deck and beat their heads against the boards in an ecstasy of hero worship. Conan, his mighty chest heaving and glistening with sweat, the red axe gripped in his blood-smeared hand, glared about him as the first of men might have glared in some primordial dawn, and shook back his black mane. In that moment he was not king of Aquilonia. He was again lord of the black corsairs who had hacked his way to lordship through flame and blood. Amra, Amra, chanted the delirious blacks, those who were left to chant. The lion has returned. Now will the Stygians howl like dogs in the night and the black dogs of Kush will howl. Now will villages burst in flames and ships founder. Aye, there will be wailing of women and the thunder of the spears. Seize this yammering, dogs! Conan roared in a voice that drowned the clap of the sail in the wind. Ten of you, go below and free the oarsmen who are yet chained. The rest of you, mend the sweeps and bend to oars and halyards. Crumbs devils, don't you see? We've drifted inshore during the fight. Do you want to run aground and be retaken by the Argosians? Throw these carcasses overboard. Jump to it, you rogues, or I'll notch your hides for you. With shouts and laughter and wild singing, they leaped to do his commands. 
The corpses, white and black, were hurled overboard, where triangular fins were already cutting the water. Conan stood on the poop, frowning down at the black men who watched him expectantly. His heavy brown arms were folded, his black hair, grown long in his wanderings, blew in the wind. A wilder and more barbaric figure never trod the bridge of a ship, and in this ferocious corsair, few of the courtiers of Aquilonia would have recognized their king. There's food in the hold, he roared. Weapons in plenty for you, for this ship carried blades and harness to the Shemites who dwell along the coast. There are enough of us to work ship, aye, and to fight. You rode in chains for the Argosian dogs. Will you row as free men for Amra? Oi, they roared. We are thy children, lead us where do you will. Then fall to and clean out that waste, he commanded. Free men, don't labor in such filth. Three of you, come with me and break out food from the after cabin. By crumb, I'll pair out your ribs before this cruise is done. Another yell of approbation answered him as the half-starred black scurried to do his bidding. The sail bellied as the wind swept over the waves with renewed force, and the white crests danced along the sweep of the wind. Conan planted his feet to the heave of the deck, breathed deep and spread his mighty arms. King of Aquilonia he might no longer be, king of the blue ocean, he was still. Chapter 16 Black Walled Kemi The venturer swept southward like a living thing, her oars pulled now by free and willing hands. She had been transformed from a peaceful trader into a war galley, in so far as the transformation was possible. Men sat at the benches now with swords at their sides and gilded helmets on their kinky heads. Shields were hung along the rails and sheaves of spears, bows and arrows adorned the mast. Even the elements seemed to work for Conan now. The broad purple sail bellied to a stiff breeze that held day by day, needing little aid from the oars. But though Conan kept a man on the masthead day and night, they did not sight a long, low black galley fleeing southward ahead of them. Day by day, the blue waters rolled empty to their view, broken only by fishing craft which fled like frightened birds before them, at sight of the shields hung along the rail. The season for trading was practically over for the year, and they sighted no other ships. When the lookout did sight a sail, it was to the north, not the south. For on the skyline behind them appeared a racing galley with full spread of purple sail. The blacks urged Conan to turn and plunder it, but he shook his head. Somewhere south of him, a slim black galley was racing toward the ports of Stygia. That night, before darkness shut down, the lookout's last glimpse showed him the racing galley on the horizon, and at dawn it was still hanging on their tail, afar off, tiny in the distance. Conan wondered if it was following him, though he could think of no logical reason for such a supposition. But he paid little heed. Each day that carried him farther southward filled him with fiercer impatience. Doubts never assailed him. As he believed in the rise and set of the sun, he believed that a priest of Set had stolen the heart of Ahriman. And where would a priest of Set carry it but to Stygia? 
The blacks sensed his eagerness and toiled as they had never toiled under the lash, though ignorant of his goal. They anticipated a red career of pillage and plunder and were content. The men on the southern isles knew no other trade, and the Kushites of the crew joined wholeheartedly in the prospect of looting their own people with the callousness of their race. Blood ties meant little, a victorious chieftain and personal gain everything. Soon the character of the coastline changed. No longer they sailed past steep cliffs with blue hills marching behind them. Now the shore was the edge of broad meadowlands which barely rose above the waters' edge and swept away and away into the hazy distance. Here were few harbors and fewer ports, but the green plain was dotted with the cities of the Shemites. Green sea lapping the rim of the green plains and the ziggurats of the cities gleaming whitely in the sun, some small in the distance. Through the grazing lands moved the herds of cattle and squat broad riders with cylindrical helmets and curled blue-black beards with bows in their hands. This was the shore of the lands of Shem where there was no law save as each city-state could enforce its own. Far to the eastward Konya knew the meadowlands gave way to desert, where there were no cities and the nomadic tribes roamed unhindered. Still, as they plied southward past the changeless panorama of city-dotted meadowland, at last, the scenery again began to alter. Clumps of tamarind appeared, the palm groves grew denser. The shoreline became more broken, a marching rampart of green fronds and trees, and behind them rose bare, sandy hills. Streams poured into the sea, and along their moist banks, vegetation grew thick and of vast variety. So at last they passed the mouth of a broad river that mingled its flow with the ocean, and saw the great black walls and towers of Kemi rise against the southern horizon. The river was the Styx, the real border of Stygia. Kemi was Stygia's greatest port, and at the time her most important city. The king dwelt at more ancient Luxor, but in Kemi reigned the priestcraft, though men said the center of their dark religion lay far inland in a mysterious, deserted city near the bank of the Styx. The river, springing from some nameless source far in the unknown land south of Stygia, ran northward for a thousand miles before it turned and flowed westward for some hundreds of miles to empty at last into the ocean. The venturer, showing no lights, stole past the port in the night and before dawn discovered her, anchored in a small bay a few miles south of the city. It was surrounded by marsh, a green tangle of mangroves, palms and lianas swarming with crocodiles and serpents. Discovery was extremely unlikely. Conan knew the place of old. He had hidden there before in his corsair days. As they slid silently past the city whose great black bastions rose on the jutting progs of land which locked the harbor, torches gleamed and smoldered luridly, and to their ears came the low thunder of drums. The port was not crowded with ships as were the harbors of Argos. The Stygians did not base their glory and power upon ships and fleets. Trading vessels and war galleys indeed they had, but not in proportion to their inland strength. Many of their craft plied up and down the great river rather than along the sea coasts. The Stygians were an ancient race, a dark, inscrutable people, powerful and merciless. 
Long ago, their rule had stretched far north of the Styx, beyond the meadowlands of Shem, and into the fertile uplands now inhabited by the peoples of Koth and Ophir and Argos. Their borders had marched with those of ancient Acheron. But Acheron had fallen, and the barbaric ancestors of the Hyborians had swept southward in wolfskins and horned helmets, driving the ancient rulers of the land before them. The Stygians had not forgotten. All day the venturer lay at anchor in the tiny bay, walled in with green branches and tangled vines through which fitted gay plumed harsh-voiced birds, and among which glided bright-scaled silent reptiles. Toward sundown a small boat crept out and down along the shore, seeking and finding that which Conan desired, a Stygian fisherman in his shallow flat-proud boat. They brought him to the deck of the venturer, a tall, dark, rangily built man, ashy with fear of his captors, who were ogres of that coast. He was naked except for his silken breeks, for, like the Hyrcanians, even the common ears and slaves of Stygia wore silk, and in his boat was a wide mantle such as these fishermen flung about their shoulders against the chill of the night. He fell to his knees before Conan, expecting torture and death. Stand your legs, man, and quit trembling, said the Cimmerian impatiently, who found it difficult to understand abject terror. You won't be harmed. Tell me but this. Has a galley, a black racing galley, returning from Argos, put into Kemi within the last few days? I, my lord, answered the fisherman. Only yesterday at dawn the priest Tututmes returned from the voyage far to the north. Men say he has been to Mesantia. What did he bring from Mesantia? Alas, my lord, I know not. Why did he go to Mesantia? demanded Conan. Nay, my lord, I am but a common man. Who am I to know the minds of the priests of Set? I can only speak what I have seen and what I have heard men whisper along the wharves. Men say that news of great import came southward, though of what none knows, and it is well known that the Lord Tutotmes put off in his black galley in great haste. Now he is returned, but what he did in Argos or what cargo he brought back, none knows, not even the seamen who manned his galley. Men say that he has opposed Tothamon, who is the master of all priests of Set, and dwells in Luxur, and that Tutotmes seeks hidden power to overthrow the Great One. But who am I to say, when priests war with one another, a common man can but lie on his belly and hope neither treats upon him? Conan snarled in nervous exasperation at this servile philosophy and turned to his men. I'm going alone into Kemi and find this thief to mess. Keep this man prisoner, but see that you do him no hurt. Crumbs devils, stop your yowling. Do you think we can sail into the harbor and take the city by storm? I must go alone. Silencing the clamor of protests, he doffed his own garments and donned the prisoner's silk breeches and sandals and the band from the man's hair, but scorned the short fisherman's knife. The common men of Stygia were not allowed to wear swords, and the mantle was not voluminous enough to hide the Cimmerian's long blade, but Conan buckled to his hip a ganata knife a weapon borne by the fierce desert men who dwelt to the south of the Stygians, a broad, heavy, slightly curved blade of fine steel, edged like a razor and long enough to dismember a man. 
Then, leaving the Stygian guarded by the Corsairs, Conan climbed into the fisherman's boat. Wait for me until dawn, he said. If I haven't come then, I'll never come. So, hasten southward to your own homes. As he clambered over the rail, they set up a doleful wail at his going, until he thrust his head back into sight to curse them into silence. Then, dropping into the boat, he grasped the oars and sent the tiny craft shooting over the waves more swiftly than its owner had ever propelled it. Chapter 17 He has slain the sacred son of Set. The harbor of Kemi lay between two great jutting points of land that ran into the ocean. He rounded the southern point where the great black castles rose like a man-made hill and entered the harbor just at dusk when there was still enough light for the watchers to recognize the fisherman's boat and mantle but not enough to permit recognition of betraying details. Unchallenged he threaded his way among the great black war galleys lying silent and unlighted at anchor and drew up to a flight of wide stone steps which mounted up from the water's edge. There he made his boat fast to an iron ring set in the stone as numerous similar craft were tied. There was nothing strange in a fisherman leaving his boat there. None but a fisherman could find a use for such a craft, and they did not steal from one another. No one cast him more than a casual glance as he mounted the long steps, unobtrusively avoiding the torches that flared at intervals above the lapping black water. He seemed but an ordinary, empty-handed fisherman, returning after a fruitless day along the coast. If one had observed him closely, it might have seemed that his step was somewhat too springy and sure, his carriage somewhat too erect and confident for a lowly fisherman. But he passed quickly, keeping in the shadows and the commoners of Stygia were no more given to analysis than were the commoners of the less exotic races. In build, he was not unlike the warrior castes of the Stygians, who were a tall, muscular race. Bronzed by the sun, he was nearly as dark as many of them. His black hair, square cut and confined by a copper band, increased the resemblance. The characteristics which set him apart from them were the subtle difference in his walk and his alien features and blue eyes. But the mantle was a good disguise, and he kept as much in the shadow as possible, turning away his head when a native passed him too closely. But it was a desperate game, and he knew he could not long keep up the deception. Kemi was not like the seaports of the Hyborians, where types of every race warmed. The only aliens here were Negro and Shemite slaves, and he resembled neither, even as much as he resembled the Stygians themselves. Strangers were not welcome in the cities of Stygia, tolerated only when they came as ambassadors or licensed traders. But even then the latter were not allowed ashore after dark. And now there were no Hyborian ships in the harbor at all. A strange restlessness ran through the city, a stirring of ancient ambitions, a whispering none could define except those who whispered. This Conan felt rather than knew, his wetted primitive instincts sensing unrest about him. If he were discovered, his fate would be ghastly. They would slay him merely for being a stranger, if he were recognized as Amra, the corsair chief who had swept their coast with steel and flame, an involuntary shudder twitched Conan's broad shoulders. Human foes he did not fear, nor any death by steel or fire. 
but this was a black land of sorcery and nameless horror. Set the old serpent, men said, banished long ago from the Hyborian races, yet lurked in the shadows of the cryptic temples, and awful and mysterious were the deeds done in the nighted shrines. He had drawn away from the waterfront streets with their broad steps leading down to the water, and was entering the long shadowy streets of the main part of the city. There was no such scene as was offered by any Hyborian city. No blaze of lamps and cressets, with gay clad people laughing and strolling along the pavements, and shops and stores wide open and displaying their wares. Here the stores were closed at dusk. The only lights along the streets were torches, flaring smokily at wide intervals. People walking the streets were comparatively few. They went hurriedly and unspeaking, and their numbers decreased with the lateness of the hour. Conan found the scene gloomy and unreal. The silence of the people, their furtive haste, the great black stone walls that rose on each side of the streets. There was a grim massiveness about Stygian architecture that was overpowering and oppressive. Few lights showed anywhere except in the upper parts of the buildings. Conan knew that most of the people lay on the flat roofs, among the palms of artificial gardens under the stars. There was a murmur of weird music from somewhere. Occasionally a bronze chariot rumbled along the flags, and there was a brief glimpse of a tall, hawk-faced noble with a silk cloak wrapped about him, and a gold band with a rearing serpent head emblem confining his black mane, of the ebon, naked charioteer bracing his knotty legs against the straining of the fierce Stygian horses. But the people who yet traversed the streets on foot were commoners, slaves, tradesmen, harlots, toilers, and they became fewer as he progressed. He was making toward the temple of Set, where he knew he would be likely to find the priest he sought. He believed he would know Tutotmes if he saw him, though his one glance had been in the semi-darkness of the Mesantian alley. That the man he had seen there had been the priest, he was certain. Only occultists high in the mazes of the hideous black ring possessed the power of the black hand that dealt death by its touch, and only such a man would dare defy Totamon, whom the western world knew only as a figure of terror and myth. The street broadened, and Conan was aware that he was getting into the part of the city dedicated to the temples. The great structures reared their black bulks against the dim stars, grim, indescribably menacing in the flare of the few torches. And suddenly he heard a low scream from a woman on the other side of the street and somewhat ahead of him. A naked courtesan wearing the tall plumed headdress of her class. She was shrinking back against the wall, staring across at something he could not yet see. At her cry, the few people on the street halted suddenly as if frozen. At the same instant, Conan was aware of a sinister slithering ahead of him. Then, about the dark corner of the building he was approaching, poked a hideous, wedge-shaped head, and after it flowed coil after coil of rippling, darkly glistening trunk. The Cimmerian recoiled, remembering tales he had heard. Serpents were sacred to Set, god of Stygia, who men said he was himself a serpent. Monsters such as this were kept in the temples of Set, and when they hungered, were allowed to crawl forth into the streets to take what prey they wished. 
their ghastly feasts were considered a sacrifice to the scaly god. The Stygians within Conan's sight fell to their knees, men and women impassively awaited their fate. One the great serpent would select would lap in scaly coils, crush to a red pulp and swallow as a red snake swallows a mouse. The others would live, that was the will of the gods. But it was not Conan's will. The python glided toward him, its attention probably attracted by the fact that he was the only human in sight still standing erect. Gripping his great knife under his mantle, Conan hoped a slimy brute would pass him by. But it halted before him and reared up horrifically in the flickering torchlight, its forked tongue flickering in and out, its cold eyes glittering with the ancient cruelty of the serpent folk. Its neck arched, but before it could dart, Conan whipped his knife from under his mantle and struck like a flicker of lightning. The broad blade split that wedge-shaped head and sheared deep into the thick neck. Conan wrenched his knife free and sprang clear as the great body knotted and looped and whipped terrifically in its death throes. In the moment that he stood staring in morbid fascination, the only sound was the thud and swish of the snake's tail against the stones. Then from the shocked votaries burst a terrible cry. Blasphemia! He has slain the sacred son of Set! Slay him! Slay! Slay! Stones whizzed about him and the crazed Stygians rushed at him, shrieking hysterically, while from all sides others emerged from their houses and took up the cry. With a curse, Conan wheeled and darted into the black mouth of an alley. He heard a patter of bare feet on the flags behind him as he ran more by field than by sight and the walls resounded to the vengeful yells of the pursuers. Then his left hand found a break in the wall and he turned sharply into another narrower alley. On both sides rose sheer black stone walls. High above him he could see a thin line of stars. These giant walls he knew were the walls of the temples. He heard behind him the pack sweep past the dark mouth in full cry. Their shouts grew distant, faded away. They had missed the smaller alley and run straight on in the blackness. He too kept straight ahead, though the thought of encountering another of Seth's sons in the darkness brought a shudder from him. Then, somewhere ahead of him, he caught a moving glow, like that of a crawling glow worm. He halted, flattened himself against the wall and gripped his knife. He knew what it was, a man approaching with a torch. Now it was so close he could make out a dark hand that gripped it, and a dim oval of a dark face. A few more steps and the man would certainly see him. He sank into a tigerish crouch, the torch halted. A door was briefly etching in the glow while the torch bearer fumbled with it. Then it opened, the tall figure vanished through it, and darkness closed again on the alley. There was a sinister suggestion of furtiveness about that slinking figure entering the alley door in darkness, a priest, perhaps, returning from some dark errand. But Conan groped toward the door. If one man came up that alley with a torch, others might come at any time. To retreat the way he had come might mean to run full into the mob from which he was fleeing. At any moment they might return, find a narrower alley and come howling down it. He felt hemmed in by those sheer, unscalable walls. 
desirous of escape, even if escape meant invading some unknown building. The heavy bronze door was not locked. It opened under his fingers and he peered through the crack. He was looking into a great square chamber of massive black stone. A torch smoldered in a niche in the wall. The chamber was empty. He glided through the lacquer door and closed it behind him. His sandaled feet made no sound as he crossed the black marble floor. A teak door stood partly open and gliding through this, knife in hand, he came out into a great, dim, shadowy place whose lofty ceiling was only a hint of darkness high above him, toward which the black wall swept upward. On all sides, black arched doorways opened into the great still hall. It was lit by curious bronze lamps that gave a dim, weird light. On the other side of the great hall, a broad black marble stairway without a railing marched upward to lose itself in gloom, and above him on all sides dim galleries hung like black stone ledges. Conan shivered. He was in a temple of some Stygian god, if not set himself, then someone only less grim and the shrine did not lack an occupant. In the midst of the great hall stood a black stone altar, massive, somber, without carvings or ornament, and upon it coiled one of the great sacred serpents, its iridescent scales shimmering in the lamplight. It did not move, and Conan remembered stories that the priests kept those creatures drugged part of the time. The Cimmerian took an uncertain step out from the door, then shrunk back suddenly, not into the room he has just quitted, but into a velvet curtained recess. He had heard a soft step somewhere nearby. From one of the black arches emerged a tall, powerful figure in sandals and silken loincloth, with a wide mantle trailing from his shoulders but face and head were hidden by a monstrous mask, a half-bestial, half-human countenance, from the crest of which floated a mass of ostrich plumes. In certain ceremonies, the Stygian priests went masked. Conan hoped the man would not discover him, but some instinct warned the Stygian. He turned abruptly from his destination, which apparently was the stair, and stepped straight to the recess. As he jerked aside the velvet hanging, a hand darted from the shadows, crushed a cry in his throat and jerked him headlong into the alcove, and the knife impaled him. Conance's next move was the obvious one suggested by logic. He lifted off the grinning mask and drew it over his head. The fisherman's mantle he flung over the body of the priest, which he concealed behind the hangings, and drew the priestly mantle about his own brawny shoulders. Fate had given him a disguise. All Kemi might well be searching now for the blasphemer who dared defend himself against a sacred snake, but who would dream of looking for him under the mask of a priest. He strode boldly from the alcove and headed for one of the arched doorways at random, but he had not taken a dozen strides when he wheeled again, all his senses edged for peril. A band of masked figures filed down the stair, apparelled exactly as he was. He hesitated, caught in the open, and stood still, trusting to his disguise, though cold sweat gathered on his forehead and the backs of his hands. No word was spoken. Like phantoms, they descended into the great hall and moved past him toward a black arch. 
The leader carried an ebon staff which supported a grinning white skull. And Conan knew it was one of the ritualistic processions so inexplicable to a foreigner, but which played a strong and of a sinister part in the Stygian religion. The last figure turned his head slightly towards the motionless Cimmerian, as if expecting him to follow. Not to do what was obviously expected of him would rouse instant suspicion. Conan fell in behind the last man and suited his gait to their measured pace. They traversed a long, dark, vaulted corridor in which Conan noticed uneasily the skull on the staff glowed phosphorescently. He felt a surge of unreasoning, wild animal panic that urged him to rip out his knife and slash right and left at these uncanny figures to flee madly from this grim, dark temple. But he held himself in check, fighting down the dim, monstrous intuitions that rose in the back of his mind and peopled the gloom with shadowy shapes and horror. And presently he barely stifled a sigh of relief as they filed through a great double vault door which was three times higher than a man and emerged into the starlight. Conan wondered if he dared fade into some dark alley, but hesitated, uncertain, and down the long dark street they padded silently, while such folk as they met turned their heads away and fled from them. The procession kept far out from the walls, to turn and bolt into any of the alleys they passed would be too conspicuous. While he mentally fumed and cursed, they came to a low arch gateway in the southern wall, and through this they filed. Ahead of them and about them lay clusters of low, flat-topped mud houses and palm groves shadowy in the starlight. Now, if ever, thought Conan, was his time to escape his silent companions. But the moment the gate was left behind them, those companions were no longer silent. They began to mutter excitedly among themselves. The measured, ritualistic gate was abandoned. The stair with its skull was tucked unceremoniously under the leader's arm, and the whole group broke ranks and hurried onward. And Conan hurried with them. For in the low murmur of speech, he had caught a word that galvanized him. The word was Tutotmes. Chapter 18 I am the woman who never died. Conan stared with burning interest at his masked companions. One of them was Tutotmes, or else the destination of the band was a rendezvous with the man he sought and he knew what the destination was when beyond the palms he glimpsed a black triangular bulk looming against the shadowy sky. They passed through the belt of huts and groves, and if any man saw them, he was careful not to show himself. The huts were dark. Behind them the black towers of Kemi rose gloomily against the stars that were mirrored in the waters of the harbor. Ahead of them the desert stretched away in dim darkness. Somewhere a jackal yapped. The quick passing sandals of the silent neophytes made no noise in the sand. They might have been ghosts moving toward that colossal pyramid that rose out of the murk of the desert. There was no sound over all the sleeping land. Conance's heart beat quicker as he gazed at a grim black wedge that stood etched against the stars, and his impatience to close with Tutotmes in whatever conflict the meeting might mean was not unmixed with a fear of the unknown. No man could approach one of those somber piles of black stone without apprehension. 
The very name was a symbol of repellent horror among the northern nations, and legends hinted that the Stygians did not build them, that they were in the land at whatever immeasurably ancient date the dark-skinned people came into the land of the great river. As they approached the pyramid, he glimpsed a dim glow near the base, which presently resolved itself into a doorway, on either side of which brooded stone lions with the heads of women, cryptic, inscrutable, nightmares crystallized in stone. The leader of the band made straight for the doorway, in the deep well of which Conan saw a shadowy figure. The leader paused an instant beside this dim figure and then vanished into the dark interior, and one by one the others followed. As each masked priest passed through the gloomy portal, he was halted briefly by the mysterious guardian, and something passed between them, some word or gesture Conan could not make out. Seeing this, the Cimmerian purposely lagged behind, and stooping, pretended to be fumbling with the fastening of his sandal. Not until the last of the masked figures had disappeared did he straighten and approach the portal. He was uneasily wondering if the guardian of the temple were human, remembering some tales he had heard, but his doubts were set at rest. A dim bronze crescent glowing just within the door lighted a long narrow corridor that ran away into blackness, and a man standing silent in the mouth of it wrapped in a wide black cloak. No one else was in sight. Obviously the masked priests had disappeared down the corridor. Over the cloak that was drawn about his lower features, the Stygians' piercing eyes regarded Conan sharply. With his left hand, he made a curious gesture. On a venture, Conan imitated it. But evidently, another gesture was expected. The Stygians' right hand came from under his cloak with a gleam of steel, and his murderous stab would have pierced the heart of an ordinary man but he was dealing with one whose thews were nerved to the quickness of a jungle cat. Even as the dagger flashed in the dim light, Conan caught the dusky wrist and smashed his clenched right fist against the Stygians' jaw. The man's head went back against the stone wall with a dull crunch that told of a fractured skull. Standing for an instant above him, Conan listened intently. The cresset burned low, casting vague shadows about the door. Nothing stirred in the blackness about the door. Nothing stirred in the blackness beyond, though far away and below him, as it seemed, he caught a faint muffled note of a gong. He stooped and dragged the body behind the great bronze door, which stood wide, open inward, and then the Cimmerian went warily but swiftly down the corridor, toward what doom he did not even try to guess. He had not gone far when he halted, baffled. The corridor split in two branches, and he had no way of knowing which the masked priests had taken. At a venture, he chose the left. The floor slanted slightly downward and was worn smooth as by many feet. Here and there a dim crescent cast a faint, nightmarish twilight. Conan wondered uneasily for what purpose these colossal piles had been reared, in what forgotten age. This was an ancient, ancient land. No man knew how many ages the black temples of Stygia had looked against the stars. Narrow black arches opened occasionally to right and left, but he kept to the main corridor, although a conviction that he had taken the wrong branch was growing in him. 
even with their start on him, he should have overtaken the priests by this time. He was growing nervous. The silence was like a tangible thing, and yet he had a feeling that he was not alone. More than once, passing a knighted arch, he seemed to feel the glare of unseen eyes fixed upon him. He paused, half-minded to turn back to where the corridor had first branched. He wheeled abruptly, knife lifted, every nerve tingling. A girl stood at the mouth of a smaller tunnel, staring fixedly at him. Her ivory skin showed her to be a stygian of some ancient noble family, and like all such women, she was tall, lithe, voluptuously figured, her hair a great pile of black foam, among which gleamed a sparkling ruby. But for her velvet sandals and broad jewel-crusted girdle about her supple waist, she was quite nude. What do you do here? she demanded. To answer would betray his alien origin. He remained motionless, a grim somber figure in the hideous mask with the plumes floating over him. His alert gaze sought the shadows behind her and found them empty. But there might be hordes of fighting men within her call. She advanced toward him, apparently without apprehension, though with suspicion. You are not a priest, she said. You are a fighting man, even with that mask that is plain. There is as much difference between you and a priest as there is between a man and a woman. By set, she exclaimed, halting suddenly, her eyes flaring wide. I do not believe you are even a Stygian. With a movement too quick for the eye to follow, his hand closed about her round throat lightly as a caress. Not a sound out of you, he muttered. Her smooth ivory flesh was cold as marble, yet there was no fear in the wide, dark, marvelous eyes which regarded him. Do not fear, she answered calmly. I will not betray you. But are you mad to come, a stranger and a foreigner, to the forbidden temple of Set? I am looking for the priest Tototmes, he answered. Is he in this temple? Why do you seek him? she parried. He has something of mine which was stolen. I will lead you to him, she volunteered, so promptly that his suspicions were instantly aroused. Don't play with me, girl, he growled. I do not play with you. I have no love for Tutotmes. He hesitated. Then he made up his mind. After all, he was in her power as she was in his. Walk beside me. He commanded, shifting his grasp from her throat to her wrist. But walk with care. If you make a move, she led him down the slanting corridor, down and down, until there was no more cressets, and he groped his way in darkness, aware less by sight than by feel and sense of the woman at his side. Once when he spoke to her, she turned her head towards him, and he was startled to see her eyes glowing like golden fire in the dark. Dim doubts and vague, monstrous suspicions haunted his mind, but he followed her through a labyrinthine maze of black corridors that confused even his primitive sense of direction. He mentally cursed himself for a fool, allowing himself to be led into that black abode of mystery. But it was too late to turn back now. Again he felt life and movement in the darkness about him, sensed peril and hunger burning impatiently in the blackness. Unless his ears deceived him, 
he caught a faint sliding noise that ceased and receded at a muttered command from the girl. She led him at last into a chamber lighted by a curious seven-branch candelabrum in which black candles burned weirdly. He knew they were far below the earth. The chamber was square with walls and ceilings of polished black marble and furnished after the manner of the ancient Stygians. There was a couch of ebony covered with black velvet and on a black stone dais lay a carven mummy case. Conan stood waiting expectantly, staring at the various black arches which opened into the chamber. But the girl made no move to go further. Stretching herself on the couch with feline suppleness, she intertwined her fingers behind her sleek head and regarded him from under long, drooping lashes. Well, he demanded impatiently, what are you doing? Where's Tutatmes? There is no haste, she answered lazily. What is an hour? or a day or a year or a century for that matter. Take off your mask, let me see your features. With a grunt of annoyance, Conan dragged off the bulky headpiece and the girl nodded as if in approval as she scanned his dark, scarred face and blazing eyes. There is strength in you, great strength. You could strangle a bullock. He moved restlessly, his suspicion growing. With his hand on his hilt, he peered into the gloomy arches. If you've brought me into a trap, he said, you won't live to enjoy your handiwork. Are you going to get off that couch and do as you promise, or do I have to? His voice trailed away. He was staring at the mummy case, on which the countenance of the occupant was carved in ivory with a startling vividness of a forgotten art. There was a disquieting familiarity about that carven mask, and with something of a shock he realized what it was. There was a startling resemblance between it and the face of the girl lolling on the ebon couch. She might have been the model from which it was carved, but he knew the portrait was at least centuries old. Archaic hieroglyphs were scrolled across the lacquered lid, and seeking back into his mind for tag ends of learning, picked up here and there as incidentals of an adventurous life, he spelled them out and said aloud, Akivasha! You've heard of Princess Akivasha? inquired the girl on the couch. Who hasn't? he grunted. The name of that ancient, evil, beautiful princess still lived the world over in song and legend, though ten thousand years had rolled their cycles since the daughter of Tutamon had reveled in purple feasts among the black holes of ancient Luxor. Her only sin was that she loved life and all the meanings of life, said the Stygian girl. To win life she courted death. She could not bear to think of growing old and shriveled and worn, and dying at last as hags die. She wooed darkness like a lover, and his gift was life, life that not being life as mortals know it, can never grow old and fade. She went into the shadows to cheat age and death. Conan glared at her with eyes that were suddenly burning slits, and he wheeled and tore the lid from the sarcophagus. It was empty. Behind him the girl was laughing and the sound froze the blood in his veins. He whirled back to her, the short hair on his neck bristling. You are Akivasha, he grated. 
She laughed and shook back her burnished locks, spread her arms senselessly. I am Makivasha. I am the woman who never died, who never grew old, who fools say was lifted from the earth by the gods in the full bloom of her youth and beauty to queen it forever in some celestial clime. Nay, it is in the shadows that mortals find immortality. Ten thousand years ago I died to live forever. Give me your lips, strong man. Rising lightly, she came to him, rose on tiptoe and flung her arms about his massive neck. Scowling down into her upturned, beautiful countenance, he was aware of a fearful fascination and an icy fear. Love me, she whispered, her head thrown back, eyes closed and lips parted. Give me of your blood to renew my youth and perpetuate my everlasting life. I will make you too immortal. I will teach you the wisdom of old ages, all the secrets that have lasted out the eons in the blackness beneath these dark temples. I will make you king of that shadowy horde which revel among the tombs of the ancients when night wails the desert and bats flit across the moon. I am weary of priests and magicians and captive girls dragged screaming through the portals of death. I desire a man. Love me, barbarian. She pressed her dark head down against his mighty breast, and he felt a sharp pang at the base of his throat. With a curse, he tore her away and flung her sprawling across the couch. Damned vampire! Blood was trickling from a tiny wound in his throat. She reared up on the couch like a serpent poised to strike, all the golden fires of hell blazing in her wide eyes. Her lips drew back, revealing white pointed teeth. Fool! She shrieked. Do you think to escape me? You will live and die in darkness. I have brought you far below the temple. You can never find your way out alone. You can never cut your way through those which guard the tunnels. But for my protection, the sons of Set would long ago have taken you into their bellies. Fool, I shall yet drink your blood. Keep away from me or I'll slash you asunder. He grunted, his flesh crawling with revulsion. You may be mortal, but still will dismember you. As he backed toward the arch through which he had entered, the light went out suddenly. All the candles were extinguished at once, though he did not know how, for Akivasha had not touched them. But the vampire's laugh rose mockingly behind him, poison sweet as the vials of hell, and he sweated as he groped in the darkness for the arch in the near panic. His fingers encountered an opening, and he plunged through it. Whether it was the arch through which he had entered, he did not know, nor did he very much care. His one thought was to get out of the haunted chamber which had housed that beautiful, hideous, undead fiend for so many centuries. His wanderings through those black winding tunnels were a sweating nightmare. Behind him and about him he heard faint slitherings and glidings and once the echo of that sweet, hellish laughter he had heard in the chamber of Akivasha. He slashed ferociously at sounds and movements he heard, or imagined he heard, in the darkness near him, and once his sword cut through some yielding tenuous substance that might have been cobwebs. He had a desperate feeling that he was being played with, lured deeper and deeper into ultimate night, 
before being set upon by demoniac Talon and Fang, and through his fear renders sickening revulsion of his discovery. The legend of Akivasha was so old, and among the evil tales told of her ran a thread of beauty and idealism, of everlasting youth. To so many dreamers and poets and lovers, she was not alone the evil princess of Stygian legend, but a symbol of eternal youth and beauty, shining forever in some far realm of the gods. And this was the hideous reality. This foul perversion was the truth of that everlasting life. Through his physical revulsion ran the sense of a shattered dream of man's idolatry. Its glittering gold proved slime and cosmic filth. A wave of futility swept over him, a dim fear of the falseness of all man's dreams and idolatries. And now he knew that his ears were not playing him tricks. He was being followed and his pursuers were closing in on him. In the darkness sounded shufflings and slidings that were never made by human feet, no, nor by the feet of any normal animal. The underworld had its bestial life too, perhaps. They were behind him. He turned to face them, though he could see nothing, and slowly backed away. Then the sounds eased, even before he turned his head and saw, somewhere down the long corridor, a glow of light. Chapter 19 In the Hall of the Dead Conan moved cautiously in the direction of the light he had seen, his ears cocked over his shoulder, but there was no further sound of pursuit, though he felt the darkness pregnant with sentient life. The glow was not stationary, it moved, bobbing grotesquely along. Then he saw the source. The tunnel he was traversing crossed another, wider corridor some distance ahead of him and along this latter tunnel filed a bizarre procession. Four tall, gaunt men in black hooded robes, leaning on staffs. The leader held a torch above his head, a torch that burned with a curious steady glow. Like phantoms they passed across his limited range of vision and vanished, with only a fading glow to tell of their passing. Their appearance was indescribably eldritch. They were not Stygians, not anything Conan had ever seen. He doubted it if they were even humans. They were like black ghosts, stalking ghoulishly along the haunted tunnels. But his position could be no more desperate than it was. Before the inhuman feet behind him could resume their slithering advance at the fading of the distant illumination, Conan was running down the corridor. He plunged into the other tunnel and saw, far down it, small in the distance, the weird procession moving in the glowing sphere. He stole noiselessly after them, then shrank suddenly back against the wall as he saw them halt and cluster together as if conferring on some matter. They turned as if to retrace their steps and he slipped into the nearest archway. Groping in the darkness to which he had become so accustomed that he could all but see through it, he discovered that the tunnel did not run straight but meandered, and he fell back beyond the first turn, so that the light of the strangers should not fall on him as they passed. But as he stood there, he was aware of a low hum of sound from somewhere behind him, like the murmur of human voices. Moving down the corridor in that direction, he confirmed his first suspicion. Abandoning his original intention of following the ghoulish travelers to whatever destination might be theirs, he set out in the direction of the voices. 
Presently, he saw a glint of light ahead of him, and turning into the corridor from which it issued, saw a broad arch filled with a dim glow at the other end. On his left, a narrow stone stair went upward, and instinctive caution prompted him to turn and mount the stair. The voices he heard were coming from beyond that flame-filled arch. The sounds fell away beneath him as he climbed, and presently he came out through a low arch door into a vast open space glowing with a weird radiance. He was standing on a shadowy gallery from which he looked down into a broad dim lit hall of colossal proportions. It was a hall of the dead, which few ever see but the silent priests of Stygia. Along the black walls rose tier after tier of carven painted sarcophagi. Each stood in a niche in the dusky stone, and the tiers mounted up and up to be lost in the gloom above. Thousands of carven masks stared impassively down upon the group in the midst of the hall, rendered futile and insignificant by that vast array of the dead. Of this group ten were priests, and though they had discarded their masks, Kone knew they were the priests he had accompanied to the pyramid. They stood before a tall, hawk-faced man beside a black altar on which lay a mummy in rotting swaddings. And the altar seemed to stand in the heart of a living fire which pulsed and shimmered, dripping flakes of quivering golden flame on the black stone about it. This dazzling glow emanated from a great red jewel which lay upon the altar, and in the reflection of which the faces of the priests looked ashy and corpse-like. As he looked, Conan felt the pressure of all the weary leagues and the weary nights and days of his long quest, and he trembled with a mad urge to rush among those silent priests, clear his way with mighty blows of naked steel, and grasp the red gem with passion toward fingers. But he gripped himself with iron control and crouched down in the shadow of the stone balustrade. A glance showed him that a stair led down into the hall from the gallery, hugging the wall and a half hidden in the shadows. He glared into the dimness of the vast place, seeking other priests or votaries, but saw only the group about the altar. In that great emptiness the voice of the man beside the altar sounded hollow and ghostly. And so the word came southward. The night wind whispered it, the ravens croaked of it as they flew, and the grim bats told it to the owls and the serpents that lurk in hoary ruins. Werewolf and vampire knew, and the ebon-bodied demons that prowl by night. The sleeping night of the world stirred and shook its heavy mane, and there began a throbbing of drums in deep darkness, and the echoes of far weird cries frightened men who walked by dusk. For the heart of Ahriman had come again into the world to fulfill its cryptic destiny. Ask me not how I, Tutmotes of Kemi and the night, heard a word before Totamon, who calls himself Prince of all Wizards. There are secrets not meet for such ears even as yours, and Tot Amon is not the only lord of the Black Ring. I knew, and I went to meet the heart which came southward. It was like a magnet which drew me unerringly. From death to death it came, riding on a river of human blood. Blood feeds it, blood draws it. Its power is greatest when there is blood on the hands that grasp it, when it is wrested by slaughter from its holder. Wherever it claims blood is spilled and kingdoms totter, and the forces of nature are put in turmoil. And here I stand, the master of the heart, and have summoned you to come secretly, 
who are faithful to me to share in the black kingdom that shall be. Tonight you shall witness the breaking of Totamon's chains which enslave us and the birth of empire. Who am I? Even I, Tutmutmes, to know what powers lurk and dream in those crimson deeps. It holds secrets forgotten for three thousand years. But I shall learn. These shall tell me. He waved his hand toward the silent shapes that lined the walls. See how they sleep, staring through their carven masks. Kings, queens, generals, priests, wizards, the dynasties and the nobility of Stygia for ten thousand years. The touch of the heart will awaken them from their long slumber. Long, long the heart throbbed and pulsed in ancient Stygia. Here was its home in the centuries before it journeyed to Aheron. The ancients knew its full power, and they will tell me when by its magic I restore them to life to labor for me. I will rouse them, will waken them, will learn their forgotten wisdom, the knowledge locked in those withered skulls. By the lore of the dead we shall enslave the living. I, Kings and generals and wizards of old shall be our helpers and our slaves. Who shall stand before us? Look, this dried, shriveled thing on the altar was once Totmekri, the high priest of Set who died three thousand years ago. He was an adept of the Black Ring. He knows of the heart. He will tell us of its powers. Lifting the grey jewel, the speaker laid it on the withered breast of the mummy and lifted his hand as he began an incantation. But the incantation was never finished. With his hand lifted and his lips parted, he froze, glaring past his acolytes, and they wheeled to stare in the direction in which he was looking. Through the black arch of a door four gaunt, black-robed shapes had filed into the great hall. Their faces were dim, yellow ovals in the shadows of their hoods. Who are you? ejaculated Tutmatmes in a voice as pregnant with danger as the hiss of a cobra. Are you mad to invade the holy shrine of Set? The tallest of the strangers spoke, and his voice was toneless as a kitten temple bell. We follow Conan of Aquilonia. He is not here, answered Tutotmes, shaking back his mantle from his right hand with a curious menacing gesture, like a panther unsheathing his talons. You lie, he is in this temple. We tracked him from a corpse behind the bronze door of the outer portal through a maze of corridors. We were following his devious trail when we became aware of this conclave. We go now to take it up again, but first give us the heart of Ahriman. Death is the portion of madmen, murmured Tutotmes, moving nearer the speaker. His priest closed in on cat-like feet, but the strangers did not appear to heed. Who can look upon it without desire? said the kitten. In Kitai we have heard of it. It will give us power over the people which cast us out. Glory and wonder dream in its crimson deeps. Give it to us before we slay you. A fierce cry rang out as a priest leaped with a flicker of steel. Before he could strike, a scaly staff licked out and touched his breast, and he fell as a dead man falls. In an instant, the mummies were staring down on a scene of blood and horror. Curved knives flashed and crimsoned, snaky staffs licked in and out, and whenever they touched a man, that man screamed and died. 
At the first stroke, Conan had bounded up and was racing down the stairs. He caught only glimpses of that brief fiendish fight, so men swaying, locked in battle and streaming blood, so one kitten fairly hacked to pieces, yet still on his feet and dealing death when Tutokmes smote him on the breast with his open hand and he dropped dead, though naked steel had not been enough to destroy his uncanny vitality. By the time Conan's hurtling feet left the stair, the fight was all but over. Three of the kittens were down and slashed and cut to ribbons and disemboweled, but of the Stygians only Tutukmes remained on his feet. He rushed at the remaining kitten, his empty hand lifted like a weapon, and that hand was black as that of a negro. But before he could strike, the staff in the tall kitten's hand licked out, seeming to elongate itself as the yellow man thrust. The point touched the bosom of Tututmes and he staggered. Again and yet again the staff licked out and Tututmes reeled and fell dead, his features blotted out in a rush of blackness that made the whole of him the same hue as his enchanted hand. The kitten turned toward the jewel that burned on the breast of the mummy, but Conan was before him. In a tense stillness the two faced each other amid that shambles, with the carven mummy staring down upon them. For I have followed you, O king of Aquilonia, said the kitten calmly, down the long river and over the mountains, across Poitain and Zingara and through the hills of Argos and down the coast. Not easily did we pick up on your trail from Tarantia, for the priests of Asura are crafty. We lost it in Zingara, but we found your helmet in the forest below the border hills, where you had fought with the ghouls of the forest. Almost we lost the trail tonight among these labyrinths. Conan reflected that he had been fortunate in returning from the vampire's chamber by another route than that by which he had been led to it. Otherwise he would have run full into these yellow fiends instead of sighting them from afar as they smelled out his poor like human bloodhounds with whatever uncanny gift was theirs. The kitten shook his head slightly as if reading his mind. This is meaningless, the long trail ends here. Why have you hounded me? demanded Conan, poised to move in any direction with the celerity of a hair trigger. It was a debt to pay, answered the kitten. To you who are about to die, I will not withhold knowledge. We were vessels of the king of Aquilonia, Valerius. Long we served him, but of that service we are free now, my brothers by death and I by the fulfillment of obligation. I shall return to Aquilonia with two hearts, for myself the heart of Ahriman, for Valerius the heart of Conan. A kiss of the staff that was cut from the living tree of death, the staff licked out like the dart of a viper, but the slash of Conan's knife was quicker. The staff fell in writhing halves. There was another flicker of the keen steel like a jet of lightning, and the head of the kitten rolled to the floor. Conan wheeled and extended his hand toward the jewel. Then he shrank back, his hair bristling, his blood congealing icily. For no longer a withered brown thing lay on the altar. The jewel shimmered on the full, arching breast of a naked living man who lay among the moldering bandages. Living? Conan could not decide. The eyes were like dark, murky glass under which shone inhuman somber fires. Slowly the man rose, taking the jewel in his hand. He towered beside the altar, dusky, naked, with a face like a carven image. 
Mutely, he extended his hand toward Conan, with the jewel throbbing like a living heart within it. Conan took it with an eerie sensation of receiving gifts from the hand of the dead. He somehow realized that the proper incantations had not been made, the conjurement had not been completed, life had not been fully restored to this corpse. Who are you? demanded the Cimmerian. The answer came in a toneless monotone like the dripping of water from stalactites in subterranean caverns. I was Dot McCree. I am dead. Well, lead me out of this accursed temple, will you? Conan requested, his flesh crawling. With measured mechanical steps, the dead man moved toward a black arch. Conan followed him. A glance back showed him once again the vast shadowy hall with its tears of sarcophagi. The dead man sprawled about the altar. The head of the kitten he had slain stared sightless up at the sweeping shadows. The glow of the jewel illuminated the black tunnels like an ensorcelled lamp dripping golden fire. Once Conan caught a glimpse of ivory flesh in the shadows, believed he saw the vampire that was Akivasha shrinking back from the glow of the jewel, and with her other less human shapes scuttled or shambled into the darkness. The dead man strode straight on, looking neither to right nor left, his pace as changeless as the tramp of doom. Cold sweat gathered thick on Conan's flesh, icy doubts assailed him. How could he know that this terrible figure out of the past was leading him to freedom? But he knew that, left to himself, he could never untangle this bewitched maze of corridors and tunnels. He followed his awful guide through blackness that loomed before and behind him, and was filled with skulking shapes of horror and lunacy that cringed from the blinding glow of the heart. Then the bronze doorway was before him, and Conan felt the night wind blowing across the desert, and saw the stars and the starlit desert across which streamed the great black shadow of the pyramid. Tot McCree pointed silently into the desert, and then turned and stalked soundlessly back in the darkness. Conan stared after that silent figure that receded into the blackness on soundless, inexorable feet, as one that moves to a known and inevitable doom, or returns to everlasting sleep. With a curse, the Cimmerian leaped from the doorway and fled into the desert as if pursued by demons. He did not look back toward the pyramid or toward the black towers of Kemi looming dimly across the sands. He headed southward toward the coast, and he ran as a man runs in ungovernable panic. The violent exertion shook his brain free of black cobwebs. The clean desert wind blew the nightmares from his soul, and his revulsion changed to a wild tide of exultation before the desert gave way to a tangle of swampy growth through which he saw the black water lying before him and the venturer at anchor. He plunged through the undergrowth, hip deep in the marshes, dived headlong into the deep water, heedless of the sharks or crocodiles, and swam to the galley and was clambering up the chain onto the deck, dripping and exultant, before the watch saw him. Awake, you dogs! roared Conan, knocking aside a spear that startled the lookout thrust at his breast. Heave up to anchor! Lay to the oars! Give that fisherman a helmet full of gold and put him ashore! Dawn will soon be breaking, and before sunrise we must be racing for the nearest port of Zingara! 
He whirled about his head the great jewel which threw off splashes of light that spotted the deck with golden fire.